true Christianity, or the whole economy of God towards man, and the whole duty of man towards God, in four books. Written originally in the German language by Rev. John Ardy, A-R-N-D-T. Translated into English by Rev. Anthony William Boheme. Printed in London, 1712. First American edition, books 1 and 2, Boston, 1809. Being read by Peter John Parises. Prefix of the author, number 1. How great and detestable the abuse of the Holy Gospel is in these last dregs of the world abundantly appears from the manners and conduct of those that boast loudly of Christ and of the purity of his word, but lead at the same time a life so prolific and altogether so anti-Christian as if they lived not among Christians but heathens themselves and professed infidels. This dismal state religion is reduced to in an age wherein vice and an empty hypocritical pretense has got the accident every, everywhere, has prevailed with me at last to publish this treatise for no other end than that those who are as yet of a good will and not quite carried away with the vulgar or torrent of the times may know at least wherein true Christianity does consist viz. In the demonstration of a true, lively, and practical faith, manifesting and exerting its life and energy by unfenced godliness and suitable fruits of righteousness, the name of a Christian being given us not only as we believe in Christ, but also as we live in Him and as He again lives in us. Number two. Moreover, I have undertaken to write this piece of practical Christianity that it may serve for an instrument how true repentance must needs proceed from the innermost center of the heart alone, how it entirely changes the mind and affections together with the other faculties of the soul and conforms in fine the whole man to Christ and to his holy gospel, renewing him day by day into a new creature. For as every seed produces fruits of a similar nature and like to the seed itself, so ought also the word of God to be a productive principle of plenty of spiritual fruits within us. And we ourselves ought to live consistent, constantly in the new birth after being made once new creatures by faith in Christ. In a word, the whole in intention and design of this book is to explain how Adam ought in us to die in Christ to live. It being not enough to know the word of God, but if we know it, it must then also be expressed in our whole life and practice. Number three, many of those that nowadays apply themselves to the study of divinity suppose it to be a mere notion in speculative science and some piece of polite learning so much in vogue among scholars, whereas it is rather a living experience and practical exercise of the soul. Almost everyone, alas, that goes about this study does it with no other prospect than to get the applause of men and to become great and famous in the world. But how few are there that will answer the true design of divinity, which is that people should be made thereby thoroughly good and holy and have their own will rendered conformable to the will of God. This is divinity itself, which should raise the mind far above the, these petty designs and selfish desires turned into a means of promoting but the better carnal ends and interests. Every one is now in quest of polite and learned men by whom he may be instructed in arts, languages, and sciences. But hardly is there any one to be met with that covets to learn from the true one and only teacher and master that great lesson of meekness and humility of heart. Though it be an un undeniable truth, that the holy exemptor of life which he has left us is the brightest pattern and safest rule to follow, and consequently the sublimest and most sovereign wisdom and art of arts, according to that of the poet. The life of Christ all learning us does teach, no human wisdom it ever can reach. Number four. There are not wanting now everywhere such men as would be thought ministers of the gospel and of Christ. But there are exceeding few that are willing to be his followers also, or imitators of his life. At this rate, 
has the Lord many ministers but few followers. Notwithstanding, it be utterly impossible for any one to be truly a minister and lover of Christ unless he be at the same time a follower of his life also, according to that. If any man serve me, let him follow me. If any one love Christ, he must needs love also to copy after his most holy life and to transcribe in his own life and conversation the humility of Christ, his meekness and patience, his cross and contempt, his reproaches and insults, though they never be so sharp and afflicting to the proposition of a tempter which never likes to be crossed by any opposition, and though we are not like to express to the full that sacred pattern of the blameless life of Christ, whilst we are in this state of our minority, yet it is met that such a state should be loved, breathed after, and pursued with our utmost endeavors. And then surely we live in Christ, and Christ lives in us. For he that says, he abideth in him, ought himself also to, so to walk, even as he walked. Number five. Truly men are nowadays so far fallen away from the substance of things into some empty and slight appearances that they will be more inquisitive about learning, arts, and sciences than about the love of God itself. They will seek to know everything else rather than to know Christ, though this knowledge exceeds in real worth and dignity all the wit, sciences, and arts of men which without it must needs prove very barren and altogether empty and fruitless. But then, as I said just now, no man can be a true lover of Christ except he be a follower, also of the holiness of his life and of the purity of his manners. But alas, so great is the degeneracy of most men in, in this age as to be even ashamed of Christ and of his life, and to count the meanness and lowliness wherein Christ appeared on becoming the life and manners of the so-called Christians. And to those belongs that just, though severe, reproof of our Lord. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father. And this is the true sense and character of our modern Christians. Fain would they have for themselves such a Christ as it would be magnificent, splendor, wealthy, pompous, um, fashionable, and comfortable, conformable to all the errors and humors of the age. If such a Christ were to be had, there would be multitudes of followers resorting to him from all parts. But now they cannot away with a Christ that is poor and indigent, meek and humble, despised and rejected by a profane world. They cannot bring themselves to have a liking to such an one. No, not by any means. They care not either to receive him, nor to profess and to follow him. And to those thereby he will answer in that day, I never knew you. As you heretofore disdain to know me in my humility and meanness, so I do not know you now in your pride and worldly greatness. I know you not from whence you are. A terrible word. Number six. Now this pro prolific life and overflowing corruption of our modern Christians, as it is detrimentally opposed to Christ and to the religion by him established, so it loudly provokes the wrath and judgment of God, who now began to gather apace on all hands, so that almost all the creatures of God, heaven and earth, fire and wind, seem to be made a weapon for revenging the affront and indignity offered to Christ by the false and former professors of Christianity. Nay, the whole frame and system of nature moved, as it were, with a just indignation, groans into the bondage of corruption, ready to break to pieces at the abounding wickedness of the world. For this, you will say, must unavoidably be followed, at last by floods of misery, by death, slaughter, and de uh, de devastations, by pestilence and other contagious and destructive de distempers. Number seven, nor is there a stop here, for the last plagues already begin to rush in upon us with so uncommon a violency, and to crowd in one after another, that men will f hardly be free at last from the revenging insults of any creature whatsoever. 
For as it was before the mighty deliverance of the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, when this nation was scourged with most dreadful plagues and afflictions, so it shall be before the last glorious deliverance of the children of God out of this world, the grand and spiritual Egypt. With unusual most dismay and unheard of judgments shall the impiety and unbelief of men be visited, and therefore it is time, nay, high time, to enter in unto an unfinished course of repentancy, while as the tide of wickedness runs so high, and to set about the work of reformation in great earnest, while as grace is offered, turning from the world to Christ, and by faith adhering to and living in him. For those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide safe under the shadow of the Almighty, and secure the interests of their souls in the midst of a profane and uh, dissolved world, to which tends also the warning of our Savior. Watch therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and that of David. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Number 8. Now to prepare your mind, friendly reader, for such a saving change required by the gospel of Christ, this treaty will furnish you with some practical instructions or a sort of manuduction towards so important a work. It explains both the nature of faith in order to obtain forgiveness of sin and the saving use of grace in order to acquire the holiness of life and reformation of manners, which is one to adore, and to evidence true faith wherever it is begotten within the heart. People greatly mistake when they place religion in nothing else than in a mere vo verbal confession, or some outward show or appearance of a formal devotion, whereas it consists rather in a lively faith, attending with the most substantial fruits of piety, and with a train of Christian virtues proceeding from faith, no otherwise is from Christ himself, to whom faith is united. And so indeed, need there is that it should be, for since faith in itself is a good altogether unseen and hidden, in the eyes of men it is but meet that it should display and manifest itself by fruits of righteousness, and hereby become in a manner visible to the eyes of others. For faith is an active principle in the mind, whereby its close adhering to and hearty embracing of Christ fetches from him plenty of heavenly grace, nay, righteousness and, have, and happiness itself. Number 9. Now, whenever this faith is raised into a firm and constant expectation of such goods as are promised in the word of the gospel, then faith has begotten hope. For what else is hope but a patient and quiet expectation of enjoying in due time the goods that have been promised to faith? The same goods being now in some degree obtained by faith and laid out again in charitable acts for the good of our fellow creatures, then charity springs up from faith, which constantly reflects back upon the neighbor that love which it has received from God. Again, when faith sustains the examination of trial of the cross and resigns itself quietly to the divine will and disposal, we may then conclude that patience is brought forth by faith. But when faith either signs under the burden of the cross or returns thanks to God for benefits received, we must then pronounce prayer to bud forth from the fruitful stock of true faith. Moreover, when the eye of faith is beholding God's power on one hand and man's misery on the other, and is now comparing one with the other, then it will bow and prostrate itself before the divine majesty. And then we may say that humility is the blessed offspring of the famed faith. When at last faith is put to a hearty concern, least by any false step it lose again what it had received, or as when the apostles phrase it, when it worketh out its salvation with fear and trembling, then the fear of the Lord proves the genuine product of the true faith, and adds the top stones to the divine structure, so happily raised and carried on by a true believer. Number 10. 
And from this, I think it is manifest that all the Christian virtues are really of the progeny of faith, or as it were, the children thereof, inseparably attending that principle from which they originally drew their first breath, life, and happiness, I say. If they be but solid, lively, and true Christian virtues sprung up from God through Christ in the Holy Spirit, then they will never be separated from faith, which, on the part of man, is the very begetting principle of them all, and makes them all return unto God, as certainly as they, by the means of faith, firm proceeding uh, from him, from whence it follows, that no man, without faith in Christ, can perform any work acceptable to God. For from hence is true hope, sincere charity, firm patience, fervent prayer, Christian humility, Fidel, fear, fear of God, but from faith. It is faith that fetches all this from Christ, that true and inexhaustible foundation of faith. It derives from him righteousness itself and all the fruits that are wont to accompany this righteousness. Number 11. But in this manner take heed, lest you perhaps intrude your own works and small beginnings of virtue, nay, not even the very gifts of the new life, into the grand article of justification. For before God there is no matter of account had of any man's work, merit, gifts, and virtues. Let them, in all appearance, be never so bright and conspicuous, but of all the sufficient merit of Christ only, humbly lay hold on by faith. But this we have spoken of at large in the 5th, 19th, 34th, and 41st chapters of this first book, and in the three first chapters of the second, to which the reader is referred. See, therefore, I say that the righteousness of faith be not confounded at any rate with the righteousness of the Christian life springing up from it, but that these two be carefully distinguished from each other, the former being the basis of the latter, and these two taken together the main hinges on which the whole life of a Christian in all its working operations must move. But then take care also, on the other hand, least by a wrong and sinister application of of this doctrine, your endeavors after a true holiness of life be in any manner cooled or lessened, for wherever a hearty concern for a daily growth in the practice of Christianity is wanting, there faith itself is wanting also, whose very nature and character is daily to purify, to change, and to renew the heart. And therefore this work of repentance and mortification must be earnestly resolved upon it being utterly impossible for any one to relish the sweet and gracious infusion of the gospel of Christ, except he has tasted before the bitterness of a contrite spirit and an unfedged sorrow of heart, according to that of the Lord. The poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Number 12. And for how shall faith quicken and raise the heart into newness of life, unless it be first deadened and... and mortified by serious contrition and afflicted with this sorrowful sense of all the formal sins and transgressions. And therefore I would have you by no means believe as if repentancy was so light and easy a matter as our superficial professors suppose to place the whole of our religion in being externally sober and righteous and and free from the foul and visible pollutions of the world. The sacred writers do not use soft and delicate but earnest and grating expressions wherever they set forth the intrinsic nature of repentancy. The apostle commands us no less than to mortify the flesh and the members which are upon the earth, to crucify the flesh with its affections and lust, to be crucified to the world, to be crucified with Christ, to present or offer up a body, a, a living sacrifice, to die to sin and to be dead with Christ, and the like, all with which exhortations of the holy apostles entirely tend to remove far from true Christianity that delicacy and softness of mind which is apt to indulge the flesh in its inordinate lust and sinful propensities. Number 13. Nor do the holy prophets of old when they describe repentance in its true and lively colors use any softer or milder expressions thereby, to mince, as it were, to palliate the matter. No, so far from that, their very words are as a hammer to break in pieces, and as a fire to burn up whatever stands in its way. They require no less than a broken heart and a bruised spirit. They will have the heart rent and not the garments. They will have us turn to God with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. But alas, 
Where is there to be found at this day so much as the level footstep of such a repentance as this? Christ himself will have us hate ourselves, deny ourselves, and forsake all that we have, if ever we have a mind to be his disciples and followers. And all these notable words, so full of strength and vigor, are made use of for no other purpose than to make us go forth with power and earnestness against the common enemy of souls, who is always busy to slack our hand in the important work of repentancy. And out of this anxious care and se severe contrition, we have a most likely image afforded us in the Pentanol Psalms of David, to which I refer the reader for fuller information about the practice of repentancy, not to mention here the terrifying menaces of a jealous God throughout the whole scripture, whereby the sinner is required to bring forth repentancy, with all the fruits answerable thereto, and this on um, pain of being forever banished from the kind and glorious presence of God. And this impartial scrutiny of a man's own heart, together with the smart and ex, uh, ex, expirations of the law, is necessary in order to make way for sweetness, temperance, and mildness of the gospel of Christ, which, when these days of toil and labor are blown over, will most certainly take place in the soul, and, by exerting its gentle operations, lead the penitent sinner into the easy, pleasant path of the love of God, strewed with the plenty of evangelical promises and display for his comfort in the scriptures. But both one and the other uh, works in us the same Spirit of God through his word. Number 14. This serious, bitter, internal penitence of the heart, together with the whole train of spiritual graces, the practice of faith, and works of charity going along with it, is the main drift and subject of the book here published. For whilst it tr treats on faith, it cannot but touch also what is so nearly related to it. And this is love, uh, the first and in immediate offspring of faith. Again, what proceeds from Christian love must needs proceed from faith also, if we trace everything up to its first source and original principle. One thing I must notice here, that is, that some of my readers might perhaps take offense at a few passages interspersed in this book, being fetched from the writings of D. Period, and then capital T-A-U-L-E-R, of Thomas de Kemp or some other pious and ancient authors, which at the first view may seem to attribute a little too much of the strength and ability um, of man in the work of conversion, from whence, nevertheless, all my books derogate. Therefore, I earnestly entreat the reader that he would be pleased to ponder well the principal scope and main design of the whole treatise without stopping or stumbling at a few particular expressions. Now, the main scope of the whole book is no other than to lay open the one hand of the secret and abominable depths of the original construction, corruption, uh, cleaving to mankind, and then the other to set forth Jesus Christ as the sole beginning, medium, and end of our whole conversion to God. This twofold consideration required to the aforesaid internal penitence of the heart runs through the whole composure of the book. As the first will influence us with a profound sense of our misery and nothingness and makes us even despair of our own strength and ability, so will the other branch of this knowledge make us ascribe everything that is really good to Jesus Christ and the great restorer of our happiness that he alone may be our all and our whole that he may work all in us, and live in us alone. Number 15. May the Lord by his Holy Spirit enlighten us all, that we may be found sincere and without offense, both in faith and life unto the day of Christ, which is at hand, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Amen. End of the prefix from the author, having been read by Peter John Parisius.